Cat and Mouse, written by James Patterson, read by Keith David and Anthony Heald. Washington, D.C. The Cross House was 20 paces away, and the proximity and sight of it made Gary Sinegi's skin prickle. It was Victorian-style, white-shingled, and extremely well-kept. As Sinegi stared across Fifth Street, he slowly bared his teeth in a sneer that could have passed for a smile. This was perfect. He had come here to murder Alex Cross and his family. His eyes moved slowly from window to window, taking in everything. On two occasions, he caught sight of Cross's elderly grandmother as she shuffled past one of the downstairs windows. Nana Mama's long, purposeless life would soon be at an end. He moved across Fifth Street, careful to stay in the shadows. Then he disappeared into the thick yews and forsythia bushes that ran like sentries alongside the front of the house. He carefully made his way to a whitewashed cellar door, which was to one side of the porch just off the kitchen. It had a master padlock, but he had the door open in seconds. He was inside the cross house. He was in the cellar. The cellar was a clue for those who collected them. The cellar was worth a thousand words, a thousand forensic pictures, too. It was important to everything that would happen in the very near future. The cross murders... There were no large windows, but Suniji decided not to take any chances by turning on the lights. He used a maglite flashlight just to look around, to learn a few more things about Cross and his family, to fuel his hatred, if that was possible. He ran his hands over folded laundry laid out on a long wooden table. He felt close to the doomed family now. He despised them more than ever. He touched the boy's small jockey underwear. He felt like a total creep, and he loved it. Suniji picked up a small red reindeer sweater. It would fit Cross's little girl, Jenny. He held it to his face and tried to smell the girl. He anticipated Jenny's murder and only wished that Cross would get to see it, too. He saw a pair of Everlast gloves and black pony shoes tied around a hook next to a weathered old punching bag. They belonged to Cross's son, Damon. He must be nine years old now. Gary Suniji thought he would punch out the boy's heart. Finally, he turned off the flashlight and sat all alone in the dark. Once upon a time, he had been a famous kidnapper and murderer. It was going to happen again. He was coming back with a vengeance that would blow everybody's mind. He folded his hands in his lap and sighed. He had spun his web perfectly. Alex Cross would soon be dead, and so would everyone he loved. London. The killer, who was currently terrorizing Europe, was named Mr. Smith. It was given to him by the Boston press, and then the police had obligingly picked it up all over the world. He accepted the name, as children accept the name given by their parents. Mr. Smith. So be it. Actually, he had a thing about names. He was obsessive about them. The names of his victims were burned into his mind and also into his heart. First and foremost, there was Isabella Calais. Then came Stephanie Michaela Apt, Ursula Davies, Robert Michael Neal, and so many others. No one understood the secret pattern of the victims, starting with Isabella Calais in Cambridge, Massachusetts, March 22, 1993, and continuing today in London. The victim of the moment was Drew Cabot. He was a chief inspector of all the hopelessly inane things to do with your life. He was hot in London, having recently apprehended an IRA killer. His murder would electrify the town, drive everyone mad. This afternoon, Mr. Smith was operating in the Tony Fashionable Knightsbridge section. He was there to study the human race. At least that was the way the newspapers described it. The press in London and across Europe also called him by another name, Alien. The prevailing theory was that Mr. Smith was an extraterrestrial, 
No human could do the things that he did. Or so they said. Mr. Smith had to bend low to talk into Drew Cabot's ear to be more intimate with his prey. Ten minutes or so after your death, Mr. Smith said, flies will already have picked up the scent of gas accompanying the decomposition of your tissue. Green flies will lay the tiniest eggs within the orifices of your body. Ironically, the language reminds me of Dr. Seuss, green flies and ham. What could that mean? I don't know. It's a curious association, though. Drew Cabot had lost a lot of blood, but he wasn't giving up. The inspector shook his head back and forth until Smith finally removed his gag. What is it, Drew? Speak. I have a wife and two children. Why are you doing this to me? Why me? Oh, let's say because you're Drew. Keep it simple and unsentimental. You, Drew, are a piece of the puzzle. He tugged the inspector's gag back into place. Mr. Smith continued with his observations as he made his next surgical cuts. Near the time of death, breathing will become strained, intermittent. It's exactly what you're feeling now, as if each breath could be your last. Cessation will occur within two or three minutes, whispered Mr. Smith whispered the dreaded alien. Your life will end. May I be the first to congratulate you? I sincerely mean that, Drew. Believe it or not, I envy you. I wish I were Drew. Drew Cabot. I am the great Conholio. Are you challenging me? I am Conholio. The kids chorused and giggled. Beavis and Butthead strike again, in my neighborhood. I bit my lip and decided to let it go. Damon, Janney, and I were crowded into the front seat of my old black Porsche. We needed to buy a new car, but none of us wanted to part with the Porsche. We loved that old car, which we had named the Sardine Can and Old Paintless. Actually, I was preoccupied at twenty to eight in the morning. Not a good way to start the day. The night before, a 13-year-old girl from Baloo High School had been found in the Anacostia River. She had been shot, and then drowned. The gunshot had been to her mouth, what the coroners call a hole-in-one. A bizarre statistic was creating havoc with my stomach and central nervous system. There were now more than a hundred unsolved murders of young inner-city women committed in just the past three years. No one had called for a major investigation. No one in power seemed to care about dead black and Hispanic girls. As we drove up in front of the Sojourner Truth School, I saw Christine Johnson welcoming kids and their parents as they arrived, reminding everyone that this was a community with good, caring people. She was certainly one of them. I remember the very first time we met. It was the previous fall, and the circumstances couldn't have been any worse for either of us. We had been thrown together, smashed together, someone said to me once, at the homicide scene of a sweet baby girl named Chenille Green. Christine was the principal of the school that Chenille attended, and where I was now delivering my own kids. Janney was new to the truth school this semester. Damon was a grizzled veteran, a fourth grader. What are you mischief makers gawking at? I turned to the kids, who were looking back and forth from my face to Christine's as if they were watching a championship tennis match. We're gawking at you, Daddy. And you're gawking at Christine, Janny said, and laughed like the wicked child witch of the North that she can be sometimes. She's Mrs. Johnson to you, I said, as I gave Jenny my best squinting evil eye. Jenny shrugged off my baleful look and frowned at me as only she can. I know that, Daddy. She's the principal of my school. I know exactly who she is. My daughter already understood many of life's important connections and mysteries. I was hoping that maybe someday she would explain them to me. Damon, do you have a point of view we should hear? I asked. Anything you'd like to add? My son shook his head no, but he was smiling too. He liked Christine Johnson just fine. Everybody did. Even Nana Mama approved, which is unheard of, and actually worried me some. Nana and I never seemed to agree about anything, and it's getting worse with age. The kids were already climbing out of the car, and Jenny gave me a kiss goodbye. 
Christine waved and walked over. What a fine, upstanding father you are, she said. Her brown eyes twinkled. You're going to make some lady in the neighborhood very happy one of these days. Very good with children, reasonably handsome, driving a classy sports car. My, my, my. A smile slid across my face. I hope you're not teaching my kids that kind of cynicism and irony inside that fancy school of yours. Of course I am. And so are all my teachers. We're all trained in cynicism, and we're all experts in irony. More important, we're excellent skeptics. I have to get inside now, so we don't miss a precious moment of indoctrination time. It's too late for Damon and Jenny. I've already programmed them. A child is fed with milk and praise. They have the sunniest dispositions in the neighborhood, probably of all Southeast, maybe even the entire city of Washington. Oh, I've noticed that. And we accept the challenge. Gotta run. Young minds to shape and change. I'll see you tonight, I said as Christine was about to turn away and head toward the Sojourner Truth School. Handsomest sin, driving a nice Porsche. Of course you'll see me tonight, she said. Then she turned away and headed toward the school. We were about to have our first official date that night. Her husband George had died the previous winter, and now Christine felt that she was ready to have dinner with me. I hadn't pushed her in any way, but I couldn't wait. Half a dozen years after the death of my wife Maria, I felt as if I were coming out of a deep rut, maybe even a clinical depression. Life was looking as good as it had in a long, long time. But as Nana Mama has often cautioned, don't mistake the edge of a rut for the horizon. Gary Sinigi squinted through a telescopic sight he'd removed from a Browning automatic rifle. The scope was a rare beauty. He watched the oh-so-touching affair of the heart. He saw Alex Cross drop off his two brats and then chat with his pretty lady friend in front of the Sojourner Truth School. Sinigi ground his front teeth as he scrunched low in the front seat of a black Jeep Cherokee. He watched Damon and Janelle scamper into the schoolyard where they greeted their playmates with high and low fives. Years before, he'd almost become famous for kidnapping two school brats right here in Washington. Those were the days, my friend. Those were the days. For a while, he'd been the dark star of television and newspapers all over the country. Now it was going to happen again. He was sure that it was. After all, it was only fair that he'd be recognized as the best. He let the aiming post of the rifle sight gently come to rest on Christine Johnson's forehead. There. There. Isn't that nice? She had very expressive brown eyes and a wide smile that seemed genuine from this distance. She was tall, attractive, and had a commanding presence. The school principal. A few loose hairs were curled on her cheek. It was easy to see what Cross saw in her. What a handsome couple they made. And what a tragedy this was going to be. What a damned shame. Even with all the wear and tear, Cross still looked good, impressive, a little like Muhammad Ali in his prime. His smile was dazzling. As Christine Johnson walked away and headed toward the red brick school building, Alex Cross suddenly glanced in the direction of Sinigi's jeep. The tall detective seemed to be looking right into the driver's side of the windshield, right into Sinigi's eyes. That was okay. Nothing to worry about. Nothing to fear. He knew what he was doing. He wasn't taking any risks. Not here. Not yet. Gary Sinigi started the jeep and headed toward Union Station, the scene of the crime to be, the scene of his masterpiece theater. Think the unthinkable, he muttered under his breath. Then do the unthinkable. At a little before eight in the morning, Gary Sinigi strolled into Union Station as if he owned the place. He knew everything there was to know about the famous train gateway for the capital. He had long admired the neoclassical facade that recalled the famous baths of Caracalla in ancient Rome. He had studied the station's architecture for hours as a young boy. He had even visited the great train store, which sold exquisite model trains and other railroad-themed souvenirs. He could hear and feel the trains rattling down below. The marble floors actually shook as powerful Amtrak trains departed and arrived. 
The glass doors 